best to get through this. <laughs> I'll say it again. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I'm going to do my best to get through this quickly by assuming most of you can do the easy bits. But please jump in at any point. As I go through each family, I'm going to, and these are the list of the families I'm doing. As I go through each family, I'll stop at the end of each one, or perhaps more precisely, at the beginning of the next, and ask, were there any questions about the group we've just looked at? But if something occurs to you, Nick said, and I'm, he's absolutely right, I much prefer, if I'm talking about a particular species and something occurs to you as a question that you want to know then, don't wait till later to ask, jump straight in. I, I really don't mind. In fact, I think I prefer it because we get a bit more of a dynamic and it isn't just me talking to my own screen and hoping that someone's still listening. So anyway, let's get going. If you've seen this presentation before, I'm sorry I'm repeating this bit, except that it is so important. So people often look at a butterfly and the first thing they worry about is what colour is it? And that isn't really especially helpful. Yes, you do want to know what colour it is, but the thing you need is to know about but most species. The whites, this isn't quite so true, but you're looking at the wing edges. So people tend to look at a butterfly and say, it was orange. And then they say to me, what's an orange butterfly? And I give them a list of eight. And they say, oh, and I say, did it have anything along the wing edge like spots? I don't know. I didn't look. So it's the wing edges. And if it's sitting still and you can look at the wing shape, the wing shape as well. So you do want to know the colour, but... That's not going to get us much further than probably just the family of the butterfly. The wing edges help us to get to species. So also think about how big it is and what it's doing, where it is and when. Now, obviously, tomorrow we'll be at Ivinghoe and the time of year tells us it will just be the early spring butterflies. So we're not going to see things that only fly late in the summer. You can tell from there. Um, actions, whether they're male or female, the males tend to chase other butterflies, especially ones which look like them, and the females tend not to chase other things, and generally speaking, to try and keep a very low profile, they're trying to be unobtrusive. If you see a butterfly that appears to be investigating a plant, that's probably a female. Males don't do that so much unless there's a female sitting somewhere in the plant that we can't see and the males can smell her and they're trying to get in towards her. But the females are looking at the plants themselves. Now we're going to start with the nymphalids. That's the group that includes things like the tortoise shell and red apple and so on. And I'm suggesting that a very quick look as perhaps it flies in and settles, or if you notice it on the ground settled in front of you, a very quick look to decide, is it basically this end of the orange scale? the pale orange, which means it's almost certainly small tortoise shell or comma, just possibly painted lady, but there's not many of them around at this time of year. Or is it very dark, which is more likely to be peacock and red apple? So a very quick look to decide how dark was it? If it flies past you and keeps flying, you could still decide, well, it was either tortoise shell or comma, or peacock or red admiral based on whether it seems orange or darker than that. But very often if it just flies past, you can't get much better than it was one of those two or one of these two. And we just have to accept that you can't identify everything that flies past. It just isn't possible. So let's begin with the orangey ones. And we're looking at wing edges, remember folks. The first thing we notice about the wing edge of the comma is that it's very ragged. I have had people say to me when they've seen these things in the spring, because remember they hibernate as adults, that poor thing must have suffered in the winter. Look at its wings. Well, no, that's actually the shape it always was. That's just the way that this butterfly is. Very ragged wings, which is a great clue to it being a common, that very ragged wing edge. But in addition, look just inside the edge of the wing, and there's a row of yellow lunules on all four wings. These little triangular marks are called lunules. Somebody must have thought they look a bit like a moon, I'm guessing, from lunule. Somebody else will say no, Nick, it was spectacles. Anyway, 
ragged wing edge, yellow inside. Now, the tortoise shell has a less ragged, but look, an obvious blue just inside edge. And the painted lady, the thing that you notice when you look at this is that the black of the forewing is all along here, and then it's broken black and orange on the hind wing, which these are not, are they at all? So this one's quite different. The edge of the forewing is all black, but the hind wing is broken black and orange, or sometimes a sort of pinky color. A few painted ladies look more pink than orange, but anyway, that's sort of irrelevant. The point is it's two different wing edge colors. So whereas the comet is continuously orange with these yellowy lunules, and the tortoise shell is black with blue lunules, the painted lady is one wing black and the other wing orange or pinky and black. So they're very different if you look at the edges. The peacock, I'm hardly going to say anything about it because it's just so obvious from these blooming grey eyes. The red apple and the painted lady look very different when you see them like this, because although the wing tip is pretty much identical, the rest of the wing is so different. And I think everybody would agree that this red stripe across the black and the red on the hind wing makes the red admiral pretty much unmistakable. There's no other British butterfly with a pattern like that. The undersides are a different matter. The underside of the red admiral and painted lady are actually very similar in that you've got the same wing tip at the top here on the forewing, and then a series of different coloured stripes that go across the forewing if you can see it. And the hind wing is a sort of a mix of colours which help the camouflage and lots of little eyes. But there is a big difference in that the red admiral is always dark and the painted lady is always approximately sandy coloured. And this is because the red admiral's camouflage is to help it live inside a hole somewhere dark through all the cold times during its life. And the painted lady, which remember is a desert species from North Africa on the edge of the Mediterranean, is camouflaged to sit amongst stones on the floor and get by without being spotted by something that might eat it by looking like the sand and the pebbles around it. So this is very dark because it tries to avoid being predated by being a, a hole and disappearing in the dark. And this, because it lives on sandy gravelly areas and tries to disappear by looking like them. So it's a complete difference in ground colour, although the patterns are very similar. Now this butterfly is one of the nymphalids, but also a brown because the few nymphalids we saw so far are not members of the brown family. This is a subgroup, the brown family is a subgroup of the nymphalids. The speckled wood is about at the moment. There are only two browns around at the minute, but we're beginning with a speckled wood because when it flies about, you might just think it was dark enough to be perhaps a red apple or a peacock. But as soon as it settles, you can see all these various pale spots all over it, many of which have black circles with a white center known as a, an eye spot because of the white pupil in the middle of what appears to be a black iris. Okay. They are usually seen, not exclusively, but usually seen in woodlands or very near woodlands. And the speckled wood has a habit of sitting in the sunny spots in the woodlands. It can fly through dark areas, but it tends to sit in the sunnier spots. And when it does sit, if it closes its wings, the thing you notice compared with all those other species we just looked at is the row of spots here, which all have white pupils. And if we just go back, these don't look. So these are the only other species with eyes on the outside in rows like this, but there's no white pupil in those. There is a white pupil in the speckled wood. And in addition, I hope you can see how the veins are prominent and the lighting helped in this particular case. The lighting from on top here shows how the veins stand out slightly. You get this sort of fluted appearance to the hind wing. Okay. So undersides, 
because these actually are trickier. The upper sides of these butterflies are definitely easier, but we use exactly the same rules about wing edges. Very, very irregular outline. This is the normal resting position of a comma with this great big hole in it just there. Well, it's not really a hole, but an apparent hole in the wing there. This is a normal resting position for a tortoise shell. And we can still see that blue margin I spoke about separating it from the yellow margin on the upper side, the yellow margin of a comma. But notice that yellow margin on the underside of the comma isn't there. So let's just focus on the wavy edge. The peacock looks a lot like the tortoise shell. But notice how this line, a dark band across the center of the wing, is relatively straight compared with the tortoise shell, which is quite wavy look. I realize that's not an absolute thing. It's something to an extent it's based on your judgment, but I think this one is straighter. And the contrast between the two parts of the peacock is definitely less than the contrast of the two parts of the small tortoise shell. The speckled wood also has a bit of a contrast here, doesn't it? But look, it's got these little eyes, which help us to determine that this is a speckled wood. And it's got these prominent veins, which are very pale. Whereas none of these have got any sign of their veins, really. Perhaps we can just about make them out there if we really look hard and use a bit of imagination. But they're obvious here. So that's the first group of butterflies pretty much done. So are there any questions about any that we've looked at so far? Excellent. I'm assuming that's no questions yet. Everybody's very happy. Good. The whites, the trickiest group of all, because not that so much that they're so much more difficult to identify, but that you don't get a chance because they don't stop. What makes the whites so difficult is they do look very similar. And they just keep flying. You see them coming from a long way off because they're really obvious being white. And they fly right next to you and then they go past you and they disappear. And they keep flying for hundreds of meters without stopping. And then you give up because it's pointless. You can't just chase them forever. That's what makes them so hard. You get an idea of which species because if they seem quite small and if they're very small and very feeble flying, then that's wood white, which we don't get in the Chilterns, but I put it in there because some of you might be interested to know that. And then we've got slightly bigger female orange tip, slightly bigger again, green vein white, and perhaps slightly bigger than the green vein white, the small white, which of all these is the one that tends to fly with the most determined flight. But a small white that's looking to feed on flowers will appear to have a slightly more hesitant, slower flight. A small white female looking to lay eggs will appear to have a slightly hesitant and slower flight. So you can't use this as a way of identifying them. It's just a guide to which it might be. If this white butterfly is obviously bigger than most of these, then it's either a female brimstone that definitely do look white when they fly past you, or a large white. You can't always tell. If they're very close to you, you might be able to see the black tips on the large white and the brimstone has no black anywhere. So that could allow you to identify that it was a large white, but it's a bit it's a bit optimistic to expect to be able to do that with every large white that goes past. Some of the so-called whites are actually yellow, and that is helpful because it narrows it down to two species. Probably should mention at this point, it's just occurred to me, that a, a very distant orange tip, male orange tip, can look yellow because of the orange on the wingtips at a distance looks yellowish, but we won't worry about that. We'll assume everything's close enough that you can see it clearly. So here are the two yellowy ones, and with any luck you know which is which. This one with a helpful clue that it's B has pointy wingtips, very pointy wingtips, and this one with a helpful tip that it's CY has a white center here, which the brimstone, oh, I was going to ask you to guess which was which. A bit silly, really, because it's pretty obvious with a B and a CY. So 
presumably by now you've all realized we're talking about the brimstone this side and the clouded yellow this side. When they fly and you see them flying either towards you, somewhere near you, and then they settle, before they settle, you'll have realized just looking at them in flight that they are different species because the brimstone is such a pale yellow color and the clouded yellow is such a deep, deeply saturated yellow color. So I've said, I think this looks like the color of a lemon, a perhaps not especially ripe lemon, and this looks like the color of custard, a very good, rich custard. And it's really quite obvious when they're flying, less obvious when they've got their wings closed like this, because it hides the strongest yellow colors, which are on the upper wings. By the way, you won't see either of these species settled basking with their wings open. They just don't do it. Now, we're going to get into the whites proper. So take a deep breath. Do whatever you do to make yourself feel a bit stronger, because here we go. Now, in my opinion, these are quite straightforward, but they're tricky because they don't stop. So once they're stopped, they're easy. Look at the small white and the small amount of scale at the edge of the wing. We're back to edge of wing, folks. Small white, small amount of black scale, which gives you a sort of gray wingtip. And it does not come down this trailing edge of the wing. This trailing edge is largely white. Now we look at the large white and we see large by shape, size and large amounts of black, which do come down the trailing edge of the wing. It's worth thinking about where the cell spot, this black spot here, where the cell spot is and whether the black scales come down the wing trailing edge as far as that cell spot. Here you can see in the small white, this small amount of black gray doesn't come anywhere near as far as the cell spot. This vein helpfully goes through the middle of it, but it never gets anywhere close to it. In the large white where this vein comes to the edge of the trailing edge of the wing, you can see the black actually comes past it. So there's a very easy way to tell small white from large white, small amount of black, small white, large amount of black, large white. What I didn't mention, some of you might have been thinking, why has he put M and F? And others will have known M for male and F for female, is there are two spots here. In fact, into the third one now. So let's just quickly look at this. There are three whites where this is something that you need to know. The small white, which I've pictured here, has one spot in a male and two or three, maybe even a streak in the female. And it's the same with the small white, the large white and the green vein white. They all show this sexual difference. But both small whites have small amounts of black at the tip. It does not come as far as the vein through the cell spot. Here are two other species. Now, what we've just said, you should be able to say whether this is a male or a female. And you should be able to tell me why you don't think it's either a small white or a large white. This is obviously a different species, but it's got these very pointy tips. So this one, the female brimstone, isn't as yellow as the male. It looks white in flight. Sometimes it looks greenish, but you can see these very pointy tips and that immediately tells you, aha, brimstone. This one, you'll probably notice if we go back to the cloudy yellow, where is it there? This obvious white in a circle of brown. This brimstone looks similar, doesn't it? But it's not anything like as contrasted. It doesn't stand out the way it does on a, a cloudy jello. But over here, we've got the green vein white. You can see the veins, which are, in my opinion, gray, not green. Here are the, the veins marked, and the veins are marked even below the cell spot. But unlike the large white, which has a continuous 
flat edge here, you've got these little triangles or chevrons. So as you see, each vein is gray, and as it comes towards the trailing edge, the gray scales are separated further and further from the vein to give you a wide V at the end. I hope everybody can see that. And this is a female because it's got various spots. If we look at the undersides, again, looking at the wing tip of the forewing, the small has very little black, just visible through the wing as a darker area. The green vein white has more, and the large white has the most black showing through the wing. So that's what we'd expect. But the green vein white has got this gray scaling along the veins. So every one of the veins has gray scales along it, falling and tumbling. And the large white and the small white can occasionally be a bit confusing, but the best way to remember is on the hind wing, the small white has almost all the gray scales below this sort of imaginary halfway line. There isn't actually a vein exactly on halfway, but most of the gray scales are below that point. But the large white, as you can see, it's got gray scales pretty much evenly across the whole wing. Now the orange tip is a white that's dead easy, provided we see the male, because the female has no orange. But they do both have this black and white checkering now, if I was to ask you, which of the other whites have that black and white checkering? You might be struggling now because I was pointing out other things. So let's just go back. No black and white checking, checkering in either the small or the large white. Again, small white, no checkering on the edge. Green vein white, well, you could argue that does look a bit like checkering, but it's quite different, isn't it? These veins go they're gray and they go all the way in. It's not just the edge of the wing, it's quite a different scale. That's forced use of a word. Uh, a different proportion, let's say, of the wing is covered with this. There's the orange tip. It's right on the very edge, look, on the margin of the wing. And that's helpful because the female orange tip, as you probably know, has no orange and looks an awful lot like green vein white. But now you know how to tell them apart because we're looking for this checkering. That checkering on the wing tips tells you, well, this one's an orange tip. This doesn't have checkering, but it does have little triangles. This one's a male with a single spot. This one's a female with a single spot because the female orange tip doesn't obey the rule of the other whites where there are more than one spot in a female. Okay. Um, the other thing, of course, about a female orange tip is that if we go back, all orange tips look just like this on the underside. So if you see it closed, it looks exactly like this. No difference on the underside male to female. You can see that checkering I spoke about even in the underside look. Wing edges once again. And I, I made this point because sometimes see a, people will tell me they've seen a butterfly which is white and appeared to have virtually no black marks at all. Sometimes the males are much more lightly marked and usually the females are much more heavily marked so you, it is worth taking that into account when you're trying to decide which species, because we know that the small white has the least, the green vein white has a middle amount of dark along the trading edge, and the large white has that large band. The female large white, that large band will be more obvious. A male large white, that band will be less obvious. So there's a possibility that you might mix up I don't think you would, but you might mix up a male large white with less obvious black and a green vein white. But I don't think you would if you remember the green vein white. The green vein white always has these little triangles. So it's not really a matter of 
with the green film, like quite how far the black comes down, it's whether it's into separate little groups. Okay, now the whites cause people trouble. Are there any questions about whites? Probably not. I've explained it so brilliantly, everyone's perfectly happy. Wow, they must be, because no one said a word. And I've not been interrupted by Nick to say there's something in the chat. So let's carry on. I can't see the chat at the minute, folks, because I put that off so I can see my screen better. Sorry, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Jeff here. Um, Hello. Um, are you going to cover the difference between spring and summer broods of large white? No. I wasn't, because I thought we'd only be seeing the spring ones. Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, good. Thank you. No, it was, it was definitely worth asking because you're quite likely to have thought of something I've completely forgotten. I remember doing this talk to a group once, and at the end, somebody said, I was surprised you didn't cover speckled wood. And as soon as they said it, so was I. Uh, I should have covered it. Right, the Browns. So the Brown family, I've gone back to them to mention that not only the speckled wood that we looked at along with the small tortoise shell and the peacock and so on, but the small heath also fly in the spring. So we've got two browns in the spring, speckled wood, small heath. We've, we've talked about the speckled wood. I shan't go through all that again, but the small heath is worth considering. There are other butterflies and day flying moths that fly around in the spring that you might mix up. One of the things that's worth mentioning once you get your eye in about the way things fly is the small heath has a slightly floppier flight than the duke butterfly and the small copper butterfly. But there are several dark, darkish brown moths that fly around in the spring which have a similar sort of flight. But that's a helpful thing, I think, that I usually know a small heath when I see it fly and don't think it's a duke or a small copper because it flies in a, a very much more I've got plenty of time sort of way. It doesn't appear to be rushing to do something because if it doesn't do it now, it's never going to get it done. And the best way to spot a small heath is by looking for this pale stripe, which comes about halfway across the wing. It's the only species with a pale stripe like that about halfway across the wing. And I think that's true right through the season, but it's very, very definitely true in the spring. You will see nothing else with a completely gray outer. You could say that's a bit brown. Well, okay, but you've got an almost completely gray outer and a very pale stripe here, and then a dark center. That is a really good clue that you're looking at a small heat. You will never see a small heath with its wings open. So if you've just seen something small and orange fly past and settle close to you, and it settles with its wings open, it could be a Duke of Burgundy. And when we go to Ingram Hole on Saturday, those of you that are coming with me, you might well find, as we did last year, that we can't find a small heath or a small copper, uh, but we can find plenty of dukes. It was rather annoying by the end of our walk that we found so many dukes and each time we hoped one of them would prove to be a small heath or a small copper to allow us some comparison between them but we kept finding dukes and not the apparently according to the books commoner small heath and small copper so small heath what we're looking for is this pale stripe here duke burgundy this is the top side which you would never see a top side on the small heath unless it was dead and something had eaten it and you're died with its wings open, but this checkering across the wings, there's only one species like that, I'll come to that later. And when it closes its wings, so it's got the same position, shape, as the small heath, it's got two bands of white cells across it, and not just the pale streak of the small heath. Okay, so the duke as far as I'm aware, is also unique in having these two pale stripes of all the spring butterflies. The summer butterflies, much bigger butterflies, which have streaks like this in bands, but in the spring, this single white streak here, small heath, 
two white streaks. If you're looking at it from a distance and you can't see the individual cells, then that's a dupe. Now, the other butterfly you might see at this time of year is a small copper. When it's sitting with its wings open, the only thing you could confuse it with is the Duke of Burgundy. But the Duke of Burgundy has black right the way across in bands, doesn't it? Let's go back to it. There we are. Look. It's nothing like as orange. Or perhaps I should say nothing like as coppery. It doesn't have the same visual smack. It doesn't appear to glow in the same way that the small copper does. Now, the small copper has this completely black central part to the hind wing. So you get this tremendous contrast orange with a black edge, and then black with an orange edge. That's the only British butterfly that looks remotely like it. And there are no moths that look like that either, with orange, and then black, and then orange. But the underside of the small copper, unfortunately, does look a bit like the underside of a small heath, doesn't it? With, I said, greyish edge with a small heath. Well, you could say that was sort of greyish, couldn't you? And it's sort of orangey on the top and then browny greyish underneath. So it's a bit small heath like. But we've now learned that the small heath always has this pale stripe. So we know not to worry too much. Small copper looks superficially like a small heath, but the pale stripe halfway across the hind wing is really obvious and says small heath. If it looks a bit like that, but it doesn't have the pale stripe, small copper. And I hope you've all been keeping up. Duke of Burgundy, two bands of pale across it. Now, I did say there is one other butterfly that looks a bit like the Duke of Burgundy with this checkerboard effect. Black lines across an orangey background and lots of veins edged in black that make individual cells stand out. And that's this butterfly, the Marsh Fertillary, which has been released repeatedly in the Chilterns in recent years. So you could see it. We might even see it on Saturday. But there is a difference, and it's luckily for us, an obvious one. Look at the edge of the wing, and there are these very pale dots. These cells here on the edge are extremely pale. They could be lemon yellow, they could be cream, but they're obviously very pale compared with the orange near them. And the edge of the duke is always orangey, the same color orange as the poor wings. So you don't get this sudden, once you're looking for it, once you know where to look, you don't get that same smack in the eye. Wow, look at those bright cells at the edge of the wing here. It's not like that with the Duke of Burgundy. Yeah, quick um, question. On, can yes, I jump in there? Of how, course, please do. How likely stroke common is, or we like to find marsh fertility in the Chilterns? And I always understood it was more of a an introduced species as opposed it is. to... Well, you're yeah. not likely to find it, but... Income Hole is somewhere where it's been seen the last three years. Used and bank at least twice. Uh, butler's hangings a few times. I, I think somebody locally is releasing them, so you might bump into them. They've been they've been seen far more frequently in the last three or four years than ever before. They actually bred at Ivinghoe last year insofar as eggs were laid and caterpillars hatched. Whether they've managed to get through the winter and the adults will fly at Ivinghoe this year, I can't be certain because they've not been reported yet, but they could appear. And equally, they could reappear, I suspect, from people releasing them, but I can't prove that they've been released. Okay, uh, thanks. So very unlikely, but definitely possible. That was a big, a good fudge answer, wasn't it? Okay, any other questions, folks, before we go on to the blues? Wow. Nick, you're the only person brave enough, or no, not Jeff asked a question too. And I, I put Jeff down quickly, so that scared everybody else off. No one else will ask me. Uh, Don't right. worry, Nick, I'll come back. Good, please, please. I didn't, didn't mean to be rude, even if I achieved it. 
Right, so anyway, the blues. Uh, these are actually, although they can be tricky at first sight, you look at them and think, well, they all just look blue. No, that's not true. They're actually quite easy. One thing you can do, whether they're flying or not, but one thing you can do, and you can do this when they're in flight just as easily, is decide what size they are, whether they're really small or moderately small or actually a bit bigger. And some of the blues are a fair size, things like the chalk hill blue, the Adonis blue, they can look to be the size of things like small, um, small heath. Common blue, holly blue, about the size of a small copper. I stuck silver studded blue in there because people have in the past said to me, where would it be on that? We won't see it in the Chilterns, but it's slightly smaller than the common blue, about the size of a brown argus or a small blue. But all these species, unfortunately, they their size is a bit variable. So size is a bit of a clue. If you see something small, really small, then the first thing you're looking for is the color, the ground color of the wing. Once you've decided, wow, that's small, and it looks like a blue butterfly. Because if you decide, well, it's really small and it's blue, actually blue, then if it's an incredibly brilliant blue, probably wouldn't be small, but that could be a donus. If it's a sort of paley purpley blue, then it's either common blue or holly. And I put the, them like that because I think the holly blue is paler and the common blue is more likely to appear purpley. But as I've written here, the small blue and the brown argus, when they're flying, they do look blue. They look a very silvery blue. But in fact, both of them are brown. So if you get a decent look at them in flight, if by some luck, as they fly, they do a sort of a hesitant keeping their wings still for just long enough for you to get, get a glance, you'll see, oh, actually, they're not blue, they're brown. And if they settle, of course, then you will see for certain. They're not blue, they're brown. Now, once we've decided whether the upper wing colour is brown or blue, it's really easy to tell them apart. So we've got an idea of something flew towards us about its size. We've decided whether it's probably brown on the upper surface or blue on the upper surface. And we decided, well, if they're brown, then it's either brown argus or small blue. Sounds quite simple. Or unfortunately, the female of three species which makes it complicated again. If it's very, very small and it's near kidney vetch plants, then it's probably a small blue. If it's a bit bigger and it's not, as far as you can tell, anywhere near kidney vetch, then it's probably a brown argus. Now, I know that's not very helpful. We will be looking at some pictures. But honestly, you're very unlikely to see a small blue where there is no kidney vetch. So just look around. If you see a tiny butterfly, when it settles, its wings appear brown, not blue, even though it looked blue in flight. It's probably a small blue if there's kidney vetch nearby. It's always a good idea to hang about and hope it stops flying, because if they're flying around, it's pretty much impossible to tell the brown argus and the small blue apart, and it could be you're actually looking at a female of one of the blue species, which are brown, the female blue butterflies are brown. Right, if it's blue, if it looks blue when it flies past you, and it looks blue because you can actually see, well, the wings are actually blue. The upper surface is actually blue. If it's fairly pale blue, I've said average size, I'm looking for a blue, and flying around the tops of bushes, a holly is incredibly likely. So I'm talking about likelihoods here, it's most likely holly. If it's average in size, it could be quite pale, but a more purpley hue, and very close to the ground, it never seems to want to fly up to any height at all, common blue. And I would say common blue tends to fly shorter distances. The holly blue is quite capable of flying a long distance along the top of a hedge or across a patch of scrub. 
probably tends to stay roughly in a patch as though it had its own little territory. If it's extremely bright blue, we're not going to see any of these on Saturday, by the way, they're not flying yet, it's been too cold this spring, then Adonis, extremely bright blue. And the brown females cannot be identified in flight, except, as I've said, you might get a hint of blue on a common blue female, but I don't think you can do it. Holly blue females, if they are literally flying past you, you could well think, well, holly blue males, because of all the blue butterflies, the holly blue is the only one which has blue males and blue females. So the brown argus has blue male, no, the brown argus has brown males and brown females. And the holly blue has blue males and blue females. But the rest have a slight difference in the colours between the males and the females, or a considerable difference, as we'll see in the pictures. Now, Colin's in on this, I think. This thing, I think I saw Colin D, which is probably Colin Murphy. He produced his own little chart of this sort of stuff, which was a really good way to, to learn it. And then he went out and tested it in the field. So well done, Colin. I put this together based on my experience, but doing your own chart to categorize the ways of telling them apart is a really good way to learn it. Well, let's start with the butterflies that have no red. So here we are, look, neither species has any red. So I'm, I'm coming at it from a different perspective now. We talked about whether it looked blue or not when it flew past you, whether it appeared to be brown or not. There are two blue species flying in the Chilterns in the spring that have got no red anywhere, upper surface or lower surface. These two are holly blue, no red at all. And these two are small blue. This one's the male, which is almost completely dark brown, isn't it? So it's got a sort of bluish hint to it. If you use your imagination a bit, you can see a hint of blue in it. And when it flies, it does somehow manage to look blue, but it isn't very blue when it settles. The holly blue and the small blue have no red, no red at all. And all the other blue butterflies we're going to look at have some red. Now, how to tell these two apart if you see the undersides? Fairly simple. The holly blue has some, um, I've forgotten what word I used for this when I was talking. Oh, there it is written down for me. That's helpful. Who wrote that? Checkered, a checkered edge to the forewing. And the small blue has no checkering on the edges anywhere. But in addition, the holly blue has streaks of black. So I always say it looks like someone put a calligraphy pen and flicked it to make each of these marks. Whereas they used something more like a fairly dark pencil and twiddled it. They twirled it round to leave a, a nice round spot on the small blue. So the small blue has spots and each spot has, a, as you can see, I hope, a halo of white. Look back at the holly blue, black streaks with no halo of white. So these two are actually fairly simple to tell apart, especially if you see the upper side, because the holly blue, no red anywhere on it at all, but it's bright blue. And the small blue, no red anywhere at all, but it's very, very dark. Sort of slate, navy blue mixture. All the other blues we're going to talk about have red on them somewhere. Now, a combination that quite a few people find tricky uh, to separate, that is, in terms of which species is it. Here we've got the female common blue and the females, the three of the blue species are brown. So the female common blue is brown, but it does have some blue on it, look. Especially along this edge here, these lunules these cells have blue edges but there's often blue by the body as well and this is a brown argus the male of the female brown argus look pretty much identical the width the body shape the abdomen the female contains all the eggs so her abdomen's a bit fatter 
but otherwise they look really identical. Very difficult to tell them apart by looking at the colours. But you can see one other thing. The brown argus has checkered margins. Can you see the black veins coming into the margins on every single wing? So whereas we mentioned the holly blue has checkered margins, it's only on the forewing. The brown argus, which obviously is brown and not blue, but it has checkered margins on every wing. And the common blue has no checkering at all. Because I like alliteration, I like to say the common blue has clear borders. I put this here because I think it is a good clue. If you see what looks like it might be one of these or one of those, before you get near it, you see it flying and land, you get enough glimpse of it to see that it could be a blue female of, of some sort, that is to say a blue butterfly, one of the brown females, or it could be a brown argus. If almost as soon as it settles, it takes off again and chases, I don't know, a hoverfly, then it's going to be a male brown argus. Just about every single thing that's the size of a hoverfly or bigger, bumblebee, honeybee, anything that sort of size or bigger that flies past the brown argus male, it will chase it briefly while it works out whether it's chasing a female brown argus or not. Whereas female blues, the brown female blues, do not do that. They do not chase other insects. They don't chase other butterflies. Now, whether we're looking at a male or a female common blue and a male or a female brown argus, there are differences between them which make it very easy to tell them apart. We already mentioned that the checkered border, the brown argus, is clear. And you can see the veins coming through the border here. So the checkered border in the brown argus is always clear and the clear border on a common blue is always clear. But in addition, the common blue has a dot in this position, whereas there's an empty space on the fore with a brown argus. So just there, there would be a spot on a common blue. In addition, these two dots here come together very close. They can sometimes, the white surround to the black dot, they can actually merge and you get the appearance of something like a figure eight just there. But if we look at the same position on the common blue, so we're just below the cell spot, look. So here, no such eight. That spot would have to move to there for it to look as this does. So we get instead, here we've got this disjunct. There's a beginning of a, a sort of circle of spots here but it gets broken because this spot's moved out a line and made an eight. Here the spots have stayed in a smooth arc. Can you see that? That helps you to see the smooth arc I'm talking about. But we don't get that on the brown argus. So three ways to tell them apart that you can see veins through the border. It can't be a common blue. If you can see a blank area here where there should be a spot, it can't be a common blue. And if there's a figure of eight there with those, it can't be a common blue. And if it was brown on the upper surface, it's a brown argus. Here we are. It's a common blue. It's a blue butterfly. And you might think, oh, I wonder if that one's an Adonis. But you can look at the clear border, nice smooth arc, and that gives you a pretty good clue. No, it's a common blue. Right back. Definitively, it's a common blue. So here's common and adonis blue. I've tried to capture the difference. This is the purpley blue I've been referring to of the common blue with that clear border. And here's the adonis blue with an electric blue, dazzling blue colour. But look at the black veins, which are really obvious on every single wing, going through the white border. Now it could be, I'll tell you that just occasionally you might see such a poor old battered male Adonis blue 
that it's lost some of its blue scales and looks a bit less electric blue. And it's lost quite a lot of its wing margins. So you can't actually tell whether it has got black veins going through the margin because the margins have disappeared. But that's very rare. Generally speaking, if you see something which is incredibly dazzlingly blue and it's got these black veins definitely there, it's an Adonis blue and there's no question. People do occasionally see brightly coloured common blue and hope that they are Adonis, but if it's got clear borders, it must be common blue. This is very similar on the underside. We see that the common blue has clear borders and the Adonis blue has the checkered pattern of the veins going through. And as I said, this is a smoother arc on the common blue. It's not as smooth here. It's almost like a question mark on the Adonis, but the clear border is the best way. Look at the wing edges. Right, well, didn't mean to put that up there. <laughs> that made it a bit easier. Anyway, there's still at least one butterfly here to identify. So on the left-hand side, you've got the upper and under of one blue species. And on the right-hand side, you've got the upper and under of another blue species. Your task is to decide what you're looking at. So for those of you who are slow to read, there's still a bit of a question about what's on the left. And for those of you that... Um, if we're quick enough to guess the one on the left, you can still have a go at the one on the right. Well, not to guess the one on the left, because I put the name up by mistake. But anyway, let me just point to the things that you should be looking at. Wing edges, folks. We've noticed that these are blue, so it can't be brown argus, can it? And it can't be small blue, because they're brown. This one's got checkered edges, but only on one wing. And this one hasn't got any checkers anywhere. Well, then there's a hint of it there. Mm -hmm. This one's got no red, and this one definitely has got red. Hmm. So what could they be? So have a think about that for about three seconds, and then I'll put the answers on the screen. So I hope you all got holly blue. No red, checkers on the four wing. And common blue red triangle marks and this clear white border. You do occasionally get this, but they do not go right the way across as they did on the Adonis. Okay, anybody who like to ask a question about the blues? Right, oh, pressing on with the skippers. There's only two. So that makes it fairly easy, except that the little devils fly very quickly, zip away from you, and because they jink as they go, they don't fly in a nice straight line, a predictable way. It often means that you lose sight of them. If that happens, I suggest you just stay where you are, try and stand very still, and wait for them to come back to where they were, because the males of both Grizzled and Ninja Skipper they have an area that they patrol regularly. So you've got a choice really. You could just stand there and wait and see if they come back. Or you could, if you know that you're coming back that way later, make a careful note of precisely where you are, go on along on your walk. And then when you get back to that point later, have another look. And the butterfly will almost certainly be back where it was. So here they are, Grizzled, which is a combination of this uh, dark chocolate with white spots and the dingy, which is a combination of dark chocolate, paler browns, and some greys. This can be quite variable, but there's always these two lines of dark cells across the wing on the forewing. Here it's the white spots that stand out. And for those of you that go looking for skippers abroad, you'll probably know that it's this tooth shape here. Looks like a, a double fanged tooth on the hind wing that helps us tell that this one's the grizzled skipper from all the other grizzled skippers in Europe. On the underside, 
it's really quite obvious that this is a grilled skipper because it sits in this position with a bit like the Duke of Burgundy, you could say, well, isn't that two bands? Well, actually, I'd say that was three, one, two, three lots of white. And the Dingy Skipper, believe it or not, if you've never seen it, this is the way it spends the night. This is the roosting position. It roosts like a moth with its wings wrapped around a flower head, usually a dead flower head rather than a flower bud. So Grizzled Skipper, black and white, Notice once more, checkered margins. Don't quite know what the advantage to any butterfly is of having all these checkered margins. Makes it, it just makes the edge harder to spot. I don't know, it seems to me it makes it a bit more obvious, but there you go. Not such a checkered margin here. And these two dark bands on the dingy. And then when it settles, the ground color is paler, but these white bands across are quite obvious in a settled grizzled skipper. If we find one on Saturday, it may well be we'll get a chance to see the underside because the weather forecast isn't all that good. So it may be that we'll find a checkered skipper, uh, no, we won't, grizzled skipper, sitting on top of a, a flower head, uh, waiting for the weather to improve. And we might find a dingy skipper settled on a flower head waiting for the weather to improve, but with its wings wrapped around like this. So that's pretty simple. There's only two day flying skippers. And you think, well, I can't really mix them up with anything else. They're not orange like the small copper. Um, they haven't got the same markings as a Duke of Burgundy, so it should be okay. But then you see this bit. Beware the similar looking day flying moths. And the two that you're most likely to mix up are this lad, the Mother Shipton. <coughs> which looks a bit like a grizzled skipper, doesn't it? And this, the Burnett Companion, which looks a bit like the dingy skipper. But um, I'll start here. The Burnett Companion always has this orange here. So actually, when you see the Burnett Companion fly, you're more likely to think you've seen a small copper, a small heath, or conceivably you'll think it was a Duke of Burgundy if you're on a, a known Duke site. You won't think to yourself, oh, there's a Burnet, but um, there's a dingy skipper, because it looks too orange. That orangey colour there really stands out in flight. But when it settles, hopefully you'll see the shape of it slightly different, it's slightly larger than a dingy skipper too. And although this one is perched on top of a flower, very helpfully, they often dive into the vegetation so they're at least partly covered by the vegetation and butterflies don't do that. The Mother Shipton, I think once you've seen the witch's face, here's her forehead and long nose. The long nose goes back towards her open mouth. Here's her pointy chin coming down here and there's her eye. Once you've seen the witch's face in the forewing, you can't mistake a mother Shipton again. Hopefully, but everyone can see the two faces there looking at each other. Whereas the grizzled skipper, of course, doesn't have a witch's face on it. Again, uh, like I said, the Burnet Companion and of all the day flying moths, it might sit in perfectly good view because you might be lucky enough to see it nectaring on a flower. But it's more likely to try and bury itself in, in amongst the grass stems or underneath the leaf of a, a bramble bush or something to keep out of sight. So as I've said in this little bit here, there are plenty of day flying moths about. In fact, there are more species of day flying moths than there are butterfly. But that isn't really relevant to us. What's relevant to us is that when you see them, one of the ways you can tell it's a day flying moth is often from the way it dives into the vegetation when it stops flying. So it doesn't fly along and then choose somewhere to settle on top of stuff. It flies along and almost deliberately buries itself in the vegetation. As I've said, try and judge the shape and resting posture of the moth, that helps, as well as the colors and so on. Um, quite a few of these day flying moths are more moths that sit from choice in places where humans might work at work, walk and disturb them. So they're not actually choosing to fly by day most of the time, it's just that they sit 
in short vegetation by the side of paths, and when you walk through, you scare them off. Uh, let's just very quickly look at them. Silver wire migrant, which is identified by this gamma shape here, which is usually very, very pale and stands out clearly. Burnet companion, we just looked at. These two, which are tiny but very, very pretty. This one is known as the mint moth or the small purple and gold on the high record. And this is the common purple and gold, which is a really pretty moth. I hope you see that at the weekend. Beautiful little moth. This is a bigger moth that many of you will have seen last summer, hummingbird hawk moth. And to my amazement, I've already seen one this year. I haven't seen many butterflies yet, but I've seen a hummingbird hawk moth. This is a small yellow underwing, which is like a half-sized version of the Burnet Companion. Again, a very pretty little moth, but tiny. So you wouldn't mistake either of these two, purple and golds, or the yellow underwing, the small yellow underwing, underwing for butterflies, but they're too small. And there's another ship to the game with her, which is face. Nick, can I, ask, just can I ask, yep. can I ask a question? Go back to Dingy and Grizzle Skipper. Most of what you've oh, covered yeah, so most of what you've covered so far, I'm assuming, are relatively generalist. So you could find them on short grass and you probably could find them in other habitats. How how closely tied would Dingy and Grizzle be to more kind of species rich short grassland? Or would you get them in other other kind of you do find them in other places. You could find both in woodland if it's got wide rides. The Burnet Companion food plant for the caterpillar is bird's foot trefoil. So that's quite widespread. But the grizzled skipper, which feeds on a whole variety of things actually, including bramble, both the grizzled skipper and the Burnet Companion lay their eggs on very tender young shoots growing above bare ground. So if it's a meadow, it's not likely to have grizzled skipper or dingy skipper because usually the grass is growing so densely that there's no bare space. Got you. Yeah. If it's a woodland ride and they've been doing forestry operations and they've created lots of um, those marks from the caterpillar tracks, it's possible. And the reason that chalk grassland in the Chilterns is good for these species is that the rabbits, the freeze thaw action in the winter, various other things, cattle, if you've got them on the site, they do create bare patches. So it's the bare patches of soil which are crucial to these two species. And that's why you don't find them more widely across the space, because when you hear that grizzled skipper can feed on uh, various species in the rosé family, including bramble, you think, well, it should be everywhere, but it needs that bare soil underneath its food plant. For you. Thanks, Nick. Welcome. Uh, so we looked at the brown day flying moths. We very quickly got some white ones. They look white in flight. They don't look quite so white when they settle. A very, very pretty common carpet. Grass rivulet, which feeds on yellow rattle, which is becoming much commoner these days across all sorts of sites because people are putting it in on purpose. The white plume, which looks like a crucified moth. There are brown versions, by the way, but this is the white plume. Now, the treble bar, which comes in two forms, but we won't get into that. It's quite a big moth, and it has these obvious three lines across it, hence the treble bar. And then we've got some moths that don't look quite the same colour. These look sort of yellowy. Shaded broad bar can be very common on some sites. Common heath, very scarce in the Chilterns, actually, but quite a pretty thing, as you can see. And the yellow shell which again can be very common at some sites in the Chilterns. I don't think you'd confuse them with any bar butterflies, though I suppose if you were being really optimistic, you might try and turn that into a Duke of Burgundy. Maybe not, no, no, nobody would be that optimistic. Oops, sorry. And then the green ones, the small emerald, the green carpet, very pretty moth, and the forester, uh, an iridescent green moth. So. These can all be seen in the Chilterns, and you could conceivably mix some of them up with our butterflies. I don't think you would, but you could conceivably. If you know they're there, you won't make the mistake. And the green moths I've included deliberately because the next slide, as you already saw, is the green hair streak. 
So that should be really easy. It's another butterfly that never sits with its wings open. If it did, you'd just see dark brown. That's the inside. And in fact, that's what you see when it flies. Surprisingly, this beautiful iridescent green is hardly visible when it flies. You just see a very small, very dark butterfly flying at a tremendous speed considering its size and zipping about usually around low bushes, sometimes above a hedge, sometimes up in trees. There's a certain spot on the flanks of Ivanhoe Beacon, uh, Steps Hill rather, where you sometimes find it around a quite tall white bean tree for some reason. But anyway, a beautiful green butterfly. And that's it, folks. I'm just going to mention something about how you might record the things that you're seeing. I would definitely say, have a look at this particular app called I Record Butterflies on your mobile phone. It's completely free, whichever system you're using. And you can look at it if you want out in the field to work out what you're looking at because it gives you information about each species. And if you click on one of the pictures, it goes into more detail. You wouldn't click on Adonis Blue and get detail about orange tip. But I don't think I should have said that because it insults your intelligence. And if you go into the orange tip details, you get a whole series of pictures in the gallery so that you can look at the differences between males and females. And things. Hopefully, you won't just be using it to help you identify what you're looking at in the field, but also to actually make some sort of recording of what you've seen. And by recording, I mean a note, not a, an audio recording, but a, a sort of online note of what uh, has been seen flying about. So what you need to do is then press this green button here, there at the beginning, and it's here on various other screens that you'll come to. That button, when pressed, takes you into recording. If you press it and release it, if you just tap it, you can record a single species at that location. But if you press it and hold it down, so click it and hold it and then let go, you get this button, which allows you to choose to make a list of species on one site or to just do a single species, but a, through a particular time, which you then specify. So some people for monitoring purposes will use the single species timed count because for instance, they might be looking at wizard skipper that was just mentioned, wanting to know how its numbers compare across three or four sites. So they might do a timed count of 40 minutes walking 200 meters on two different sites and see what they get by way of comparison. But most often it's used, the species list is what we use I record for because we go to a site and we note down everything we see on that site in the species list. And the brilliant thing about it is the phone, if you've allowed the permissions, will record where you are, so you don't need to put that information in. It will put the date in for you, so you don't need to put that date in. And if you're any, in any doubt about any of the butterflies, not only do they appear like this, so you can just look to see which one you've seen in front of you, but when you click the picture after you've touched species list, it adds that. So I click species list, up comes another page on which you'll see the instruction add species. And when you click add species, it will give you these pictures. And, ah, I saw a brimstone, I saw an orange tip, and they go into your list of what you've seen. And as you see, it says flying now in your area. It actually predicts what you're going to see. So this is from this time, I actually set this up last week, but this is what was predicted for a site I visited last week. The most likely thing they thought I would see was a brimstone followed by an orange tip, followed by a peacock, and then a dingy skipper. Well, sadly, I didn't see the dingy skipper, but I did see the brimstone, orange tip in the distance, and a peacock, several. So it's really good because it takes away a lot of the worry. It's not likely you'll see something it doesn't predict. It's possible, and sometimes you will, but most of the things that come up here in the, did you see these, are exactly right, which takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Uh, there are different ways to record. If you prefer to wait until you get home and put things into a computer there, you could use the PC recording portal, Butterfly Recording for Butterflies in New Millennium, and that's through the Butterfly, Count, uh, Butterfly Conservation website, or you could just write everything out longhand and send to your 
Thank you, butterfly recorder. If you like recording everything you see, I would recommend iRecord. You can do absolutely everything that's a living thing on iRecord. And that just about brings us to the end, I think. Obviously, got time for any questions. I don't think we have. I don't think we've overrun by too much. And it says here, worth the donation you made. I didn't mention at the beginning. My fault. Sorry. But I did want to say that if any of you think this has been good, and as a result, you want to put a couple of pennies into put my conservation's pot, I'd be grateful on Saturday if you come along and you want to. That's good. If you don't want to, that's absolutely fine, too. There's absolutely no need. All this is provided free, but just occasionally people think about the fact that putting all this stuff together does take quite a time. But I'm going to shut up now because we should not even brought it up. I see quite a few things in the chat. Are any of these questions? Yeah, there are a couple, Nick, if that's OK. Um, of course it is. So two, two of the questions are linked to the surveying methodology, yep. if that's OK. So from Colin, if oh, you're yes, OK, Matt Colin, I'll, I'll read your question, Colin, if that's OK. Um, yeah, that's fine, Nick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Yes, well, I, so, I remember what it said, I think. Thank you. Okay, in which case, yeah, so well, the question just to recap for everybody, I guess, is can you yeah. clarify sunshine on the recording sheet? Yes, it's, question it's is in, either, in 10 percent, in 10 percent increments. Yes. So it's the time, it's not how bright the sun is. So assuming you've got a reasonably solid shadow that is 100 percent sun for that moment. So if you walk a section of your survey, and all the way through that section, you've got that solid shadow from the sun, then that's 100%. But if only half the time you walk along your section, the sun is shining enough to give you a, a, a shadow, then it's 50%. Does that answer the question, Colin? Does, thank you, Nick. Good, thank you. Thank you. And I think it was Lavinia. Yes, there's an additional question from Lavinia is linked, but as an addition to sunshine question, what if the walk takes you through the trees, so no shadow? Um, in that case, you have to look to see what the sun is doing outside the trees, which are putting you in the shade. So if I'm walking as a woodland section and I can see that the sun is shining on the tops of the trees, but where I am, it's shady because of the trees. That counts as 100% sun. So it's not whether you personally are in the shade. It's whether the sun is shining. Does that answer your question, Livinia? Yes, thank you. And I'm very happy, Livinia. Your question wasn't about why do we have to learn about moths. And thank you very much for not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've heard me say it before. Okay. I, I think I might have done, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question again from Lavinia asking Colin if he can share his um his chart of blues, his crib sheet for blues. And thanks, Colin, for answering. Yeah, if you want to send it to me, Colin, I can um I can forward it around to the group as well, if that's okay, if you don't mind the copyright. So thank you. No, of course not, Nick. Yeah, no, happy to happy to share it. Just, just, yeah. Yeah, it's very good. I recommend people looking at it because comparing the two, Collins and mine, will help people get a, a much better idea of things to look for. Absolutely. So while we're not leaving moths, living yet, if, on when you're back into <laughs> tracking the impact group, someone's posted an amazing photo of an emperor moth at College Lake from today. That's a corker of a photo. So when you're next into there, have a bit of a look at the emperor moth that was at wow. College Lake today. So, yeah, brilliant. Well, they are but, at... They are flying around at Ivinghoe since two weeks ago, so who knows? We might actually see one. Brilliant. Oh, Emily, you're on the call. Yes. Well, what were you doing posting when you were in the middle of the call? <laughs> you're supposed to be concentrating listening to Nick, not posting. But anyway, thank you for that. Nice sighting. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you for that. Um, so, so I guess lastly, before we all leave for the evening, Nick, is probably just any last minute notices about Saturday, logistics for Saturday? Um, uh, well, I will do my best. If people have said to me, if people have let, let me know through the WhatsApp that they are coming, if I decide it's a complete washout and we're only going to get wet and cold, 
I will WhatsApp those people to tell them that I've decided to cancel. At the minute, I'm going in the hope that the forecast will prove to be worse. I and mean, it's not a dreadful forecast at the moment, it's not very good. So we'll, we'll go and try. We, can, we should be able to find some things roosting. Uh, the most difficult part often is meeting people at the beginning. So we'll be in the car park on Beacon Hill, the one that the ice cream van goes to. So the one with a proper surface to it, not parking on the grass and mud on the side of Steps Hill. So we're going to the proper car park. You've come up, I'm assuming you've come uh, from Ivinghoe, you've come up the main B4009, was it 4008? And you've turned over the cattle bridge, you've gone up the windy road, you're pulling in on the left to the car park there, the one where the ice cream van very often is. And I will try to be at the high end, the uphill end. <laughs> I'll stand there with my net so that people can see me. And think, what's that bloke doing over there with the net? He's never going to catch a fish up there. That should work. That sounds good. So the message is, it's on unless you hear otherwise on the WhatsApp group, but keep an eye yeah. on the group just in case. Yeah, yeah and bring a raincoat. <laughs> just just to be if we all wear raincoats it won't rain we'll be fine and some money for an ice cream yeah possibly yes <laughs> depends how warm we get climbing back up out of the hole might just warm us up good stuff so any other last questions before we disperse for our thursday evenings anything else yes one question oh, yeah, all... hey sir so, um I'm not sure. Are we when you're talking about the WhatsApp group? Are we talking about the tracking the impact, or is there a butterfly ID group? Uh, we did have, didn't we? And I noticed we did. That. Yes, there was a butterfly group one and butterfly group two, but I can't remember now whether they were email groups. There, I think they were WhatsApp groups. There is a WhatsApp it group. Was. There is a butterfly ID course, and I'm just checking Hazel now if you're on it or not. And it doesn't know you are, but you will be in about two seconds. <laughs> I'm not sure with my my uh, history on I on IT and stuff. I'm wondering whether anybody wants me on it. <laughs> no, well, well, you're on it well, now. Yeah, good. Okay. What, one one thing that definitely, if you're at all in doubt and you're not sure whether you've managed to make WhatsApp work properly, by all means, ring me on Saturday morning. I think. Do I say we we're going to meet at ten thirty? I don't remember. Saturday seems a long way off still. I think it's 10.30, so if you want to ring me by 10 o'clock, you should see what I think. Yeah, meet okay. at 10.30, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was. Okay, but by all means, ring up if you want to, to check whether we're going. I'm, I'm of the opinion that I too often say I won't go to somewhere because the weather forecast is bad, and then I sit at home getting very cross because the weather isn't actually as bad as it was forecast. Yeah. So I think it's better to go and give it a try. Okay. You normally find something. Brilliant. Yeah. In which case, I will thank you, Nick, for your time this evening and Not another really clear, concise presentation. Thank you for that, and wish you well for Saturday. It'd be good to um, thank you. See how here you get on. Any good photos? Any kind of notes on the WhatsApp group? Great to see what you find, and um, and even more importantly, then hope you find things when you go and do your surveys. If you're doing any kind of surveys this year. Um, the weather hopefully has turned and things will start to open up a bit for your May session. So, so thank you, Nick. Good luck on Saturday. And um, we'll and speak thank you, Nick, because mm -hmm. you've organised it all and done all the hard work behind the scenes. Yes. One yes. last thing before you go, Nick. Yep. Goodbye, everybody else. By the way, bye bye. By all by all means, feel free to leave the meeting. It's turned out, Nick, that yep. I See volunteered you. to walk Square SP ninety one oh nine. I think has to one. Yep. Yes. And I shouldn't have done, apparently, because that's one of your squares, apparently. But I thought you told me it wasn't. No, the Hasto one is one of the chess extension squares. Ah. And I've got you down as covering it, which is brilliant. If that's well, okay. I, I still can. But we discovered today that we'd included in our Upper Thames branch, in a list that we sent out to people in one of our newsletters, we'd included quite a few squares that shouldn't have been in our Upper Thames branch allocation. They were either allocated to you or somebody else, and somehow they infiltrated our lists. So that's so how I volunteered for this square, was because it was top, I was told it was an Upper Thames branch one. 
So I thought, uh -oh. well, I can't have a square that I live a mile from unwalked. Not covered, yeah. It's so I guess anyway, it doesn't from our side of things. No, it doesn't it, make any difference. It, it, it's an upper Thames square that is also one of the tracking the impact selected squares, of which right. there are a few. So it well, doubles up as both. So if you're keen, and, and in a way, they're probably more priority where it doubles up that it's an upper Thames and it's yeah, a tracking it's not the upper impact. Thames anymore. It's only tracking the impact. So okay. I can walk it for you. If you've, if you've got time, Nick, I've got you down uh, as I covering will do it. My if, best. I will if do you my haven't best got to time. get there a few times. Yeah, it I went more than three, but that. I, I I can do that. Whatever you can do. I went around with the bird, the um, surveyor who's covering the birds on that square, and it, there's quite a nice wander up through um, Pavis Wood. There's some quite nice woody rider bits as well. There's not a huge, there's quite a lot of arable. Like, well, you know the land, don't you? Very further than yeah. I do. But yeah, it's quite a nice route. But I, I, if you've got time, I don't know how you find time, but if you've got time, that would be. Yeah, I, that's the, the issue, isn't it? Because I, I volunteered thinking, well, I can't have a square right next to my home but, that no one's doing. That would look bad, wouldn't it? If you know, I'm asking people, can you volunteer? And then they say, well, there's a bit right where you live. So I've, I volunteered and then was told, actually, it's not one of ours, but I am st I'm still prepared to do it. If you, um, if you, if you if can, that'd be If anyone else comes in and they want to fight me for it, I shall immediately hand it over. But Likewise. I'll, okay, I'll do brilliant. it this season. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. Great stuff. You're welcome. And thanks brilliant. very much again, Nick. Very no good problems. No, good stuff. Well, thank you again and good luck on Saturday. Yeah, I think we might. <laughs> we, we might need some luck. All right. Who then. knows? Brilliant. All Cheers, Nick. Bye. Cheers. Bye now.